Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me again to that passage in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 34. One of the most recognisable phrases in popular culture is this phrase, the truth is out there. The truth is out there. Maybe you're familiar with that phrase. The phrase is used in conjunction with paranormal activity, UFOs and things like that. To say that the truth is out there. The truth is out there. You have to go and to look for it. It's hidden, but it's there. You need to go and to seek the truth about these paranormal things to find that it really is out there. But as we come to the Gospels and as we come to Jesus in these passages, what Jesus is saying is not that the truth is out there, but that the truth is here. The truth is here. And the truth has been hidden, but the truth is now being revealed. And you don't have to go and to seek the truth out there. Instead, you have to look to Jesus, or more than look to Jesus, as he says here, you have to hear and to receive Jesus with faith. Jesus is saying in his teaching here, the truth is here. All you need to do is hear and receive with faith. And so in this passage, the lessons on hearing that we had last week and in the previous passage continues. And along with these lessons on hearing, we have the lessons on who Jesus is, who Jesus is and what he came to do. We see as we go through these verses in Mark, these early chapters in Mark, that Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God. And we have here also, as we go on through these few verses today, lessons on how the kingdom of God works and on how the kingdom of God will finally triumph. And so we have this first illustration in verses 21 to 22. Verses 21 to 22. Jesus says to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Now, we might be familiar with this analogy that's used in different ways through the Gospels. This analogy of the lamp being put on a stand and not hidden away is used in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. And there Jesus uses it to talk about how as believers, as people who have come to trust in Jesus, we should not hide that. We should not hide the effect that Jesus has had on our lives. Instead, we should allow it to shine before the people around us. But in telling this illustration here, Jesus is talking not about Christians or about his followers. He's talking about himself. Jesus here is the lamp that is going to be revealed Jesus is being, as we go through Mark, slowly but clearly revealed to the people and to us who read God's word. And initially, of course, God's purposes were hidden, weren't they? We have in the Old Testament all of these promises that are made about how God is going to save his people. Think of the promise that was given to Abraham, that him and his wife though they were advanced in age, would have a son. They didn't know how that promise was going to come true. They didn't know how it was going to come to fulfillment. But they did see that promise come to fulfillment. But they were also given a promise that through their seed, through their descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's a promise. The solution to which was hidden from them. They would never see how that would work out in their earthly lives. Lots of other promises made in the Old Testament. And yet God's ways are hidden. We do not yet see how he is going to um, fulfill his promises to his people. And then we come to Jesus and God's purposes start to be revealed to us. And we see Jesus, don't we, being born in the early chapters of the Gospels. And there's moments there where angels declare what has happened, where shepherds come, where kings come and worship him. And then things go quiet, don't they? Jesus is tucked away in Nazareth and no big fuss is made for years and for years. And then Jesus, as he begins his ministry, is in Capernaum, a really small town there in Galilee in the Middle East. 
And again, God's purposes are hidden. Who Jesus is, is yet to be revealed. And then his ministry begins. His miracles start. His teaching with authority begins. And God's purposes start to become clear to us. Jesus starts to be revealed to us. His glory starts to be revealed. His power starts to be revealed. The fact that he is God in the flesh starts to be revealed and will become even more clear. In the next passage, we'll look at Jesus calming the storm. We see the divine power there that Jesus has. Jesus is saying here that what is hidden is going to be revealed. He is the light that is going to illuminate the way. So this is the first point for this morning. Jesus is revelation. Jesus is revelation. He reveals something to us. He teaches us something. Jesus reveals because Jesus is the light which cannot and should not be hidden, but is rather brought out into the open to give light to all who see it. But what does Jesus reveal? Well, firstly, Jesus reveals God. We started with those verses from Hebrews chapter one. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so it goes on. Jesus is God. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And he is God's means of speaking to us, to show us what God is like, to show us who God is, to show us God's character. So Jesus reveals God to us. And in doing this, he reveals something else to us, doesn't he? He reveals our sinfulness to us. As we hear Jesus' teaching, as we look at the way that Jesus lives, how he deals with the people that he comes into contact with. It shows us, for one thing, doesn't it, how far we fall short of his standards. As we hear Jesus teaching and showing us that God is holy and perfect and just, that he will judge sin, that he will judge those who reject him and who reject God, that reveals to us our position before him that we have wandered away from him, that we have fallen short of his standards, that we have failed to recognize who he is. So Jesus reveals God and he reveals our own sinfulness. He reveals the great gap that there is between God on the one hand and us on the other. But Jesus also reveals salvation. He reveals the bridge between us and between the holy God. Jesus reveals the way for us to be saved from our sin, from our failures, from judgment, from his judgment against our sin. Jesus reveals the way for us to be forgiven, for us to be saved and accepted, and even more than that, to be adopted into God's family, to be called the very children of God. And yet, in the case of Jesus, this was a process, wasn't it? He was a baby that was revealed to be God in the flesh, revealed to be the king. And he is slowly being revealed to us. And the high point of Jesus's revelation to us comes not here in his teaching, not in his miracles even, but at the cross. It's at the cross of Calvary that we see this most clearly. It's there that we see God's character most clearly. It's there that we see God's holiness most clearly, how seriously he takes sin. And yet it's there also that we see his love and mercy. Because it's there that we see Jesus, the perfect holy one, dying in the place of sinners. That they might receive new life, that we might receive new life through faith in him. It's at the cross that God's character is revealed. It's at the cross that our sinfulness is revealed. And it's at the cross that the way of salvation is revealed. That through faith, we might be brought back to God. We might find relationship with God. And of course, the Gospels don't stop there at the cross, do they? 
They go on to show that Jesus rose from the dead, that he rose from the dead in victory over sin and Satan and death. And that reveals to us that all who trust in him will not perish, but will know everlasting life. Jesus reveals to us God's character, our sinfulness, and the way of salvation. His resurrection revealed his victory. Yet even today, there's an element of hiddenness to all of this, isn't there? We look at the world around us. We look at our own lives and we see that although Jesus has defeated sin and Satan and death, our lives are still filled with sin and its effects. The world is full of darkness and no peace. And we constantly grieve the death of loved ones. There's an element of hiddenness even to God's victory because it has not yet been fully revealed. The original context of Mark's gospel, the original audience that Mark wrote to were believers being persecuted in first century Rome. Many Christians being killed for their faith. And they would have felt this, wouldn't they? That Jesus had won the victory, but for them, it looked like struggle and it looked like death. In our day-to-day lives, often we don't see Jesus and his glory, do we? We don't see Jesus and his victory even. Others around us question our faith and the decisions that we make because they have failed to see Jesus. They have failed to see that Jesus reveals God's character, our sinfulness, and the way of salvation. They fail to see that revealed at the cross, and they fail to see Jesus's victory revealed in the resurrection. In Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us that this is because we suppress the truth, that our hearts become darkened because we don't see Jesus and what he reveals. But the message there is that this will all be revealed when we die or when Jesus returns. The truth will be brought out into the open. It will be plain for us all to see. But the problem is then that it may be too late for us. And that's why Jesus gives us this challenge in this passage, verse 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Verse 24, consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Jesus says it and he says it again. Hear, listen. Listen carefully and consider carefully what you have heard. Why? Because what you are hearing, and he's talking about the people then, and he's talking about us this morning, what we are hearing is the revelation of God. It's the revelation of God that shows us our sin, and Jesus shows us the way to be saved. Remember Jesus' words to Peter when Um, Jesus said to them, will you also leave me? And Peter said, where else will we go? Where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One who came from God. These are the words of eternal life, to hear and to trust in Jesus. Someone was giving you instructions that could save your life. You would listen very carefully, wouldn't you? If someone said, this is going to happen to you, and if you follow these steps, if you do this, then you will live. You'd listen carefully and you'd make sure that you put it into practice. So this morning, listen like your life depends on it. Listen like your life depends on it. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't trust Jesus, listen like your life depends on it, because it does. And if you are a Christian, listen like it's life-giving words from your perfect father and friend. Every time you open up the Bible, every time you hear it preached, listen like it's life-giving words from your perfect father and friend, for that is what it is. And now if someone comes to you and says, I've got some really important information that I need you to take on board and I need you to put it into practice. If they then spoke to you, the very important information, Would you just walk away without saying a single word? No, you'd respond appropriately to the information that had been given. And Jesus teaches for a response. 
Jesus reveals and Jesus needs a response. So Jesus' revelation and Jesus demands a response. This is the second point. Jesus demands a response. And whether we know it or not, we will all give a response. We'll either respond in faith, we'll respond with rejection, we'll say, no, that's not true, that's not for me. Or we'll just walk away apathetic and not do anything. But that too is to give a response of rejection. And this is what we see in verses 24 and 25. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. The message of those two verses is that the response you give is what you will receive. The response you give is what you will receive. If you consider carefully what you hear, if you weigh it up and determine it to be wonderful and glorious truth, the wonderful and glorious truth is what will be given to you. Wonder and glory will be given to you. These verses say what we attain now in this life will be multiplied and will be multiplied even more in the life to come. If we respond in faith and follow Jesus, we find relationship with him and we'll get even more of that, even more perfectly in glory. If our response is to not follow Jesus, then that's what we'll get. We will not get Jesus. And even what we do have will be taken away. We'll lose our life. We'll lose all the good things that we have now in this life, in the life to come. In the life to come, we will only know judgment, righteous judgment for our sins. So the question is, what is our response? This is the most important thing for us to think about this morning and in our lives on earth. Each and every one of us are created with eternal souls. And how we hear these words, how we respond to these words of revelation from Jesus will affect our lives here on earth and our future destination. What will we get? Will we have glory or judgment? Will we know hope, peace, heaven and Jesus? This is what we can know through faith in him. So we've seen the revelation of Jesus. We've seen the need for a response. And the third and final thing that we see in this passage is the results of a response to the revelation of Jesus. The response, the results of a response to the revelation of Jesus. So revelation, response, and results. And we see this point on two levels. Firstly, we see the results in our hearts as individuals, but also this passage speaks to us of the results of the kingdom of God more generally. So let's consider this. And the first thing we see is the certainty of results. The certainty of results. Verses 26 to 29. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is, grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. The certainty of results in the lives of those who hear the word, the certainty of the triumph of the kingdom of God. The farming theme here is repeated and it's talking about the kingdom of God with a focus on how there will be certain results. They're mysterious, but they're certain. And they start from a mundane, a muddy beginning, a farmer in his field with tiny seeds, simply scattering them into the dirt. These apparently ins inconsequential tiny seeds thrown down onto the dirt. Yet this tiny seed will certainly do its work. The seed will certainly do its work day to day, night to night. The seed mysteriously but certainly sprouts and grows. The farmer does not know how, yet it does. And it works towards a huge harvest. 
that far outweighs the tiny and insignificant seeds that were sown at the beginning. From muddy and mundane, tiny beginnings flow certain, um, but slow, but certain results. A glorious harvest in the end. And this has a couple of significant applications for us this morning. A response of faith to the revelation of Jesus will certainly lead to glorious results. A response of faith to the revelation of Jesus will certainly lead to glorious results. It certainly will. We don't know how, but it certainly will. We often feel like it won't, but it certainly will. We often feel like we're on a path of self-sabotage and that we're somehow going to stop the results. But they will certainly come. If our faith is in Jesus this morning, we can be certain of a glorious harvest. We can be certain of his ultimate triumph in us and through us. Even when it looks impossible. Even when we can't understand how. Even when the storm rains fall or the sun beats down we can be certain of glorious results. And what does the farmer do but simply wait? He rises and he goes to sleep. He waits with faith, knowing that the harvest will come. We stand firm and God works. Sometimes it feels like we're going through the motions, doesn't it? Feeling like nothing changes. We come to church and we go home. The week goes by, we come to church and we go home. We open our Bibles, and we pray and we close our Bibles, it feels like nothing changes. But God is at work. We rise and we go to sleep. God is at work bringing a harvest when we respond to his revelation with faith. Even when our progress in the Christian life is slow, even when it feels like we're going backwards, we can press on towards certain results. So take courage this morning. If you've responded with faith to the revelation of Jesus, a harvest will come. There's another thing to note at this point, and that is that in the Bible, harvest often means judgment as well as salvation. In the book of Joel and in the book of Revelation, the time of harvest means some going to glory and others going to judgment. And so once again, we have to bear that thought in mind this morning. When the harvest comes, when Jesus returns or we go to glory, where is our destination? It all counts on our response to the revelation of Jesus. And the second and final thing that we see about the results of the kingdom of God is the contrast between the beginning and the end, between the beginning and the process. Look with me at verses 30 to 34. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the per birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. We see here a contrast between the small beginnings and the glorious results of the kingdom of God. I used to sing a kid's song which goes like this, faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. But that's not the point of this parable. The point of this parable is the contrast between the tiny beginnings of the kingdom of God and the glorious end of the kingdom of God. The difference between that tiny seed and the biggest of all garden plants where even the birds can take shelter in the branches. And we see this with Jesus. We see this from the small beginnings. Trev told us and reminded us, didn't he, about the baby Jesus there lying in a food trough, his humble beginnings in coming from glory and taking on flesh, humble beginnings, his glory veiled in humanity, his suffering, his scornful and shameful death on the cross. Yet he rose in power and ascended into glory. 
And we look at our own lives, don't we? We look at the small response of faith to Jesus' revelation that will one day lead to certain and glorious results in glory. It's such a contrast in the gospel there, isn't it? We hear the message and simply respond with faith. Such a small thing, and yet what do we get? We get heaven, we get relationship with the God of all the universe. Such a contrast. And yet this, this is the kingdom of God. This is the gospel that we believe. For nothing but trusting Jesus, we get heaven and we get him. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, small, yet bringing certain and glorious results. And an implication of this If the kingdom of God begins small and ends glorious, an implication of this is that in our own lives, the kingdom of God can be at work powerfully, even in the small and mundane and apparently inconsequential areas of our lives. As we go through our lives doing many things which seem small, many things which go unseen, things that we do that go unthanked, in those little things that you do in your work life, in your family life, with your friends. All of these things are not irrelevant to the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God starts small and is at work powerfully in and through these small things, working towards a glorious end. And one of the final results is that even those who are once hostile are brought into the kingdom of God. I love here that we're told this little detail in verse 32, that when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. We were told about the birds, weren't we, in the parable of the sower, and there the birds were the enemy. They came down and pecked at the seeds and took them away and stopped them from bearing fruit. And yet here now in this little parable, the birds are the beneficiaries of the kingdom of God. They have come in and are taking shelter in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will triumph. And many people who were outside, who were opposed to Jesus and his message, can come in and find shelter and find life. In the future, we will all see, one way or the other, that this tiny seed has conquered all in eternity. And so, will we here this morning listen to the revelation of Jesus? Will we respond in faith? And will we see certain and glorious results? Let's pray.